So today we are discussing the final chapter of the book of the book Spatial Statistics for Data Science Theory and Practice with R. So the final chapter it is by about point process modeling, chapter twenty three. So the learning objectives or to understand that spatial point process intensity can be modeled with a Gaussian random field, and that we can use our inla to model this intensity with spatial correlation. It is really the major subject of this chapter. So up to now, we have considered the intensity of a spatial point process as a fixed parameter, either of the whole study region A, um, in case of a homogeneous Poisson process. So we then have the intensity parameter lambda, which is the expected uh, number of events um, divided by the area of the region A. So this is really the density of the, the um, average density of events, or we can consider it as a spatially varying parameter in an inhomogeneous Poisson process, then it is a function of the position x. So this is also can be expressed as a number divided by an area, but so this is for infinitesimally um, small areas. So with, in both cases, this is a, this is a fixed property of the spatial point process. But we can also approach intensity as a locally stochastic variable with a distribution. So in this case, we use actually the Poisson distribution because it's still about a number of points in a unit area. And if we want to fit this model to an actual observed point pattern, we can use the number of events in subregions A i uh, of the region A and use the area of AI as an offset. So an offset in a Poisson distribution, it means that you make the distinction that you actually express the total number of points in this case um, as being um, property of this subregion AI so that you distinguish this number of points in that subregion as being composed by the number of points in a unit area. So for example, per square meter or per square kilometer and multiply it by this area. And then you have a number. So in this case, we can, we will also use this in this chapter. So using the area of AI as an offset. So the mu s, so it's the, the, the expected mean, it's, it's fit using a lock link and a linear predictor eta, which is specific to the spatial position S. So this is, as in general, it is a, a Poisson model. And so it's a generalized linear mixed model. And so the linear predictor, so this linear predictor, it's composed of, can be composed of fixed effects, a spatial random effect um, being a Gaussian random field, which we have discussed in the part about geostatistical data in this book, and an unstructured random effect, which is just uh, observation specific, for example. So, more in general, a process where a response variable can be expressed as a Gaussian process using a log link. In this case, it's a Gaussian random field, but for Gaussian processes in general with a log link, we call these uh, models uh, log Gaussian Cox processes. So this is just theoretical background, but this, this formula here that is for the linear predictor of this model it will be important because we are going to use at least the spatial random effect. We are also going to use some uh, local random effect as well. So the Gaussian random field can be fitted for a spatial point process using either a regular grid or a triangulated mesh. Actually, the classical methods to do this is with a regular grid. It's um, explained in the chapter rather brief, briefly. Uh, but the book uh, really elaborates the, the second method uh, with the triangulated mesh because it's more modern and it has the advantage that it does not rely on binning. 
the observations or the event locations, but it respects their exact location. So this will be uh, this will be done with Imna. So we have been using our Imna for geostatistical data in chapter fifteen. So we already um, saw how this is done. So there is a lot of similarity between uh, chapter twenty three and chapter fifteen. So in both cases, the spatially correlated random effect is expressed as a Gaussian Markov random field, which is a GRF with uh, special um, special conditions. And there are some differences as well, especially because of the difference in the response variable. So in geostatistical data, so that's for chapter 15, the stochastic process Z, S, it's a continuous response variable often, and it can be observed everywhere in the domain D. So you, you really have a response variable which can take several values and can be observed everywhere in theory. While in a spatial point process, actually the domain is itself considered stochastic because it's the locations where the events can occur. So point patterns arise when the variable to be analyzed corresponds to the location of events. This is actually uh, a rehearsal of um, the introduction of the book, uh, which I'm um, repeating here, because this is really a difference between chapter 15 and 23, because it's about a different type of response variables. So the aim in that chapter was that, uh, so to fit a statistical model that can support various distribution families for the response variable with fixed and random effects with spatial correlation structure, and that will provide spatial predictions with uncertainty measures, which is also very interesting uh, and specific to the modeling approach. There we specify the spatial random effect as a Gaussian random field with zero mean and a metern correlation. So many of these things will remain the same. But for a spatial point process, we are going to model the intensity. So not so much the events themselves, but the intensity. And we are going to do this over the whole study region. So this makes it more like geostatistical response in the sense that you have some continuous response variable that you will predict everywhere. It is the intensity. So the linear predictor for the intensity, it's modeled as a local intercept plus a Gaussian mark of random field with zero mean and matern correlation, like in chapter 15, is the spatial random effect, which expresses the spatial autocorrelation. And to do that, just like there in the chapter 15, we will fit an SPDE, stochastic partial differential equation. It will be fitted on the vertices of a triangulated mesh. So this is, a, this is actually a method. It's not really explained in the book, but it's a method to fit a Gaussian mark of random field on the nodes of a triangulated mesh. Also, we will fit this intensity by modeling the number of points per unit area. So this reminds us of the using the offsets. And so the area offset for the mesh vertices, it's determined by a second mesh, actually. So it's called a dual mesh, which is polygons around the primary ver mesh vertices. So we will see that when we uh, discuss the example. But it means that there is a second mesh with polygons around the nodes of the first mesh, and those will serve uh, as the weight or as the offsets, um, because this is the area then of the polygons that is being used. So the respondent mesh vertices then is set to an initial observation of zero points, because there are no point observations at the mesh nodes with an offset according to the dual mesh, so which is the area of the polygon that surrounds the mesh node each time. Um, so that's for the response of the mesh vertices, while the response at the event locations is set as one with an offset of zero, with, because there we have no area, it's just the location, the point. Another thing, which is the same as chapter 15, it's that once these 
values have been fitted at vertices of the mesh, they can be interpolated to locations of interest. So to fit values at observation location, to predict values at prediction locations. And to do that, a projection matrix needs to be constructed, which expresses the relationship between those point locations and the mesh nodes. So it's always done by um, defining coefficients for the three mesh points of the triangle where the location falls within. But that's already discussed in chapter 15. So for this projection matrix, we have all rows representing the locations of interest, so the new points, the observation points or predictions. Columns will represent the mesh vertices, so these, this matrix will contain the coefficients, and only three columns will be set different than zero. So it's only the closest um, mesh vertices which are used to interpolate to the points within that triangle. So, um, and those are the barycentric coordinates of um, these locations. So the sums then of those three weights, you could say, say uh, it is one each time for each location. So the values on the projection matrix are used as weights to interpolate observation from observation to triangle vertices as well, because when fitting them, you have to fit um, to the triangle vertices, but then also from triangle vertices to prediction location. So this is also then in the spatial point process case. And we have this for the observation locations, which are composed both by the mesh vertices and the event locations. And then it is done for the prediction locations. So that's more or less the theoretical and the theoretical side of what we are going to do and also um, showing what is similar to chapter 15. So we are going to use these packages. So SF will be used for the vector. Data Terra will be used to create a prediction grid. Tidy Terra can be used for plotting uh, Terra objects. And then we have DeepLayer for data rendering. Our natural earth is used for the map of Bolivia because we are going to discuss a case in Bolivia. And then in law, of course, and ggplot2. Uh, we also define a custom coordinate reference system in this way. It's actually a UTM zone 19S, which Bolivia lies within, but with a specific unit, because normally it is in meters, and this defines it as kilometers. Actually, I should add that nowadays, because the book it's already a couple of years old. Nowadays, proj strings are only used for projection operations and not anymore to define coordinate reference system themselves. But while this still works, uh, what you cannot do anymore is define the geodetic datum. So this actually has no defined datum anymore. But in fact, it's um, difficult, it seems, to do it in another way, which we will see in a minute. So the topic, the case study, it's about modeling the occurrence of the plant genus Solanum in Bolivia between 2015 and 2022. So it's data from GIBE, which is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which has millions and millions of occurrences of um, of species around the world. So in the book, a function is used um, that really connects to the GBIF database, but just for reproducibility reasons, I have downloaded or at least written the result into a CSV file, which will be stored in the Git repository of this book club, so that this can always be reproduced in future. So what we have is this CSV file with occurrences from which we extract the longitude and latitude. We convert it to an SF object to really define it as a spatial object, setting the correct coordinate reference system, which in this case is the WGS84. So it's a geographic 
coordinate preference system, which means it's ellipsoidal coordinates. And then the ST transform makes it a projected coordinate reference system. So it's it's 2D in, in uh, so with this coordinate uh, reference system, which we have defined uh, just before. So this is the data. Then the map of Bolivia, we can, with the NE countries function from our natural earth, we can request or at least load from the package, the country Bolivia and return it as an SF object. And by default, it has the coordinate reference system 4326, which is WGS84 as well. But we need to transform it in a projected coordinate reference system. So we do it the same way. But as I said, this is not really the current way one wants to define coordinate reference systems anymore. The problem is because this is not an EPSG defined coordinate reference system, you have to somehow do it via a custom modification of the original um, coordinate reference system. So I've tried that as well. So what you can do, and it does work, is, OK, let's first transform to the UTM of Bolivia, which is it's also in the book, this EPSG code. So this is the standard coordinate reference system, but it is in meters. So what we wanted to have as a conversion, it's changing units from meters to kilometers. That can be done nowadays with the custom Proj pipeline. So the Proj library is being called here by SF, and it uses this syntax. It, it, it uses the unit convert operation, and then the XY out parameter defines the units which you need. So this is in the Proj website, it is defined very well. So SF does support this, but unfortunately, we have so we do have the result and the coordinates are in kilometers but unfortunately the resultant object loses its coordinate reference system so which makes further processing for this specific example uh, more problematic so i i've posted an issue about it in the sf repository just today and i see they're already discussing with the project developer himself um how to go Further with this, so perhaps um, in some, perhaps in some future, as F or Proch version, this would work actually. So and that would be the way you want to go, because Proch strings should only be used nowadays to define conversions or coordinate operations and not coordinate reference systems themselves. So that, that's um, just some side notes, you could say. So the observed occurrences, it's the spatial point pattern itself. So it's the object D. And so we have an SF feature collection. So we have 267 events and just the geometry, which is in this object. So it's all we need. It's just we don't use any other response variables. So it's the really just the point location and the as you can see, the um, units is in kilometers. We also store the coordinates as a matrix because that will be useful for the model, I guess, or for creating the mesh, perhaps. Um, and as we can see, this is still the same number of points. We can plot this data. So the, with the map in the background and the D data in the foreground, we get this map of Bolivia with the locations of the genome, the genus Solanum. All right, so before we can actually call the INLA function, which fits the model, we need to make some preparations. So we need objects which we are going to input in the inla statements. And it's similar to chapter 15 with some differences. Of course, because for example, the dual mesh, we did not need that in chapter 15 because we did not use an offset. We, in chapter 15, we only had to create a triangulated mesh. Here we are going to create the mesh and the dual mesh. We need to calculate the offsets based on the dual mesh to fit intensities instead of numbers. 
We need to define the SPDE model. We need to construct the projection matrix for observation locations and for prediction locations, which are the coefficients that link the mesh, so the, just the triangulated mesh with the observation locations or the obs prediction locations respectively. And then we are going to create a stack. It's, it's a structure which INLA uses to collect all data and projection matrices um, that are needed for the model with the data for estimation and prediction. So create a mesh. It's You can do it with inla.mesh.2d, although I saw that actually there is a more modern function in a separate package to create meshes, which can and should be used instead. But here I did not change uh, the code. So what it uses is the vertices of the boundary or of the border of Bolivia. So this means the map, it's just a polygon, one single polygon of Bolivia. The ST coordinates function extracts the point coordinates of the vertices of the of the border of Bolivia. So it and it takes the X and Y columns of that matrix. So we have just a matrix of X and Y coordinates that we provide to create a mesh. So it sees, okay, I will create a mesh inside and optionally outside of this border. So um, we have some arguments here. Perhaps first of all, the offsets argument. It is about, if I've understood it well, so the first um, part of this, it's in the same unit. So this is in kilometers. So this is how far outside the border the mesh should be created in the first step, which is, I think, mandatory. The second one, it's optional. It's to create an exterior um, layer or, or mesh on top of that on, at the outside. So it's with a coarser uh, mesh typically, but just to have some more uh, extra space around it in the mesh. So this is just the distance, the, the width of, of these borders around the border of Bolivia. and. So in the interior of the uh, of the mesh, when the edges of the triangle should be at most 50 kilometers, while in the exterior parts, they can be at most 100 kilometers. So we have coarser, a coarser mesh at the outside. The cutoff equal to one kilometer, it means that locations which the mesh is based on, so it's about these coordinates, those locations, should at least be one kilometer apart to be taken into account. If they are closer apart, the documentation of this function says it will actually create a new point, which is the center of those original points. So to prevent, this is done to prevent that triangles are getting too small and, and some strange things would happen then. You so you get a mesh object which has several elements in it, uh, amongst which the number of mesh vertices, which is almost 2000 in our case. So, if we plot it, we get this picture, for example. So, I show here the mesh itself, the border of Bolivia. So, you can see that the inner part of the mesh, which has the more the smaller triangles, it's already a bit distant from the border of Bolivia. So that's, that's 50 kilometers, while then the exterior part is another 100 kilometers, and it has coarser triangles, larger triangles. So the purple dots, it's the point pattern. So we can expect that we would get intensities higher in this area once this is being modeled with a Gaussian random field. Um, all right, then we create a dual mesh. There is a specific function being used for that, which is taken from another book and which is cited. And so the, in this case, I well, the, the, the function is printed in the chapter. In this case, I stored it in the script so it can be loaded here. And the, this book.mesh.dual function, it creates the dual mesh from the original mesh. So if we plot this, we get this. So let's let's enlarge a bit. So 
we still see the original mesh as gray lines. And if you look carefully, and you can especially see it in the outer ring, you get polygons, this light blue, these light blue ones, around the vertices. So these are polygons that are nicely separating the areas within uh, those triangles so that the yeah, they are as equal as, as possible amongst each other. So here, those polygons are much more, it's, it's hard to see, in fact, in this uh, picture, you should still uh, enlarge it more. Then from this dual mesh, we need to calculate the offsets. And this was another challenge because the code in the book uh, wouldn't work anymore. Uh, simply because the RGOS package was being used and this package has, reti has been retired I think um, last year, because it has been superseded by, by newer packages. And so the Geo, the RGOS package, it was actually a wrapper around, about, around uh, operations provided by the Geos library, which is not an in, in R package, but uh, a system library with, with functions to do geometric operations, such as um, intersections, calculating um, surface areas and such. So here I've done it with um, yeah, SF functions, you could say. So first of all, from the dual mesh objects, I've created an SF object with the appropriate coordinate reference system and also an extra column with the ID because we will need to join it in a minute. So the actual vector so the, the vector w it is being created in the book with the rgus functions but here the, the most important that's happening here is the first line it's the fact that an intersection is being created between the dual mesh and the border of bolivia because we don't want to have um, surface areas outside of the border of bolivia so there the offsets are set to zero. That's uh, the purpose of uh, what the code is doing in the book. So these um, weights or, or area offsets, they are the surface area of the dual mesh polygons inside Bolivia, and they are zero outside of the border of Bolivia. So to distinguish these two types of dual mesh polygons, we need to make the intersection between the dual mesh and the map of Bolivia. Furthermore, the polygons that overlap the border of Bolivia need to be split. So this will be done by this ST intersection function. So you get extra polygons. Uh, then you can compute the area of those polygons. So this means that for this, the polygons that have been split on the border, you have you just have their, their own um, surface area, then we drop the geometry, just use this, this as data, and we join it with the dual mesh. OK, and then we set, OK, if the area is missing, then we, we are going to set it as zero. And then we can pull the area. So we have a, for the, the the mesh vertices, we now have the area offsets that corresponds to the specific mesh nodes in this way, which we then can use further on. So the vector W contains surface areas in square kilometers within Bolivia. So while well, outside of Bolivia, there are zero. So you, you do have quite some zeros, as you can see, but we have large polygons, uh, dual mesh polygons inside Bolivia as well. So if we take the sum, this should be the surface area of Bolivia, and you can check and that it is true indeed. So when we calculate the area of the original Bolivia polygon, we get the same number. All right, so we have created dual mesh. We have created this, this area offsets. We also have the triangulated mesh. We now define the SPDE model, which, is, which just needs the yeah the conditions well or the, the specifications needed to fit this Gaussian random fields. So it's essentially the mesh itself and then an alpha argument which was already 
um, discussed in chapter 15, and it's um, yeah, it's a function of the new parameter of the Gaussian random field, which is the smoothness parameter of the spatial autocorrelation. So it's something you can change, but this is the value used in the book. So it defines a Gaussian random field with Matern correlation, and it is stored in the SPDE object. So in the model formula, this will be part of the model formula. So a random effect, which defines the Gaussian random field, it will refer this SPDE object. All right, so S, that will be an index referring to the location. That's just looking forward. We still need to construct the projection matrices for observation locations, which are composed both by the event locations and the mesh vertices themselves. We use this function in case of the event location. So in inla.spde.make.a, A is always the symbol for the projection matrix in inla. So it uses the mesh and also the coordinates of the event location. So it then can create a projection matrix that links these two sources or data sources. Now the mesh vertices, well, the projection matrix for mesh vertices, since a projection matrix is always about projection projecting mesh vertices to something else. In this case, it projection projecting mesh vertices to themselves. So it's just a diagonal matrix of ones, but it's still needed because the intensity needs to be fitted also on the mesh vertices. So it, these two projection matrices can be combined as rows because the columns are the mesh vertices. So if we look at the dimensions, we then have these 1975 mesh vertices as columns and 2,242 rows. So these are composed of this n mesh and the n, which is the number of points of the or events that are observed. So we have this is the projection matrix being used. Actually, I find quite puzzling. This is really done in this way, but it is actually an approach which is borrowed from the book of Kryinsky et al., which uh, the author of our book uh, refers to. So this is so the, the fact that the mesh vertices are indeed incorporated as observation locations. So then the prediction locations, we also need to construct them first before we can create also the projection matrix for them. So the prediction locations, so for which we request an outcome of the model, a prediction of the model, it will be a 100 by 100 raster. So that's the dimension of the raster um, using the map of Bolivia um, as the basis. So this results in a spot raster object. So rust is a Terra function. Then we can transform it to a SF points object by converting the raster to its cell center coordinates with the CRDS function of Terra. Then we this is a matrix. We need a data frame first because before we can convert it to an SF object. So we get a data frame with XY columns, the SDSSF can define this, these two columns as coordinates of the points which we are creating here and also set the coordinate reference systems of these points, which we just borrow from the map object, which, are, which is also an SF object. So the results DP, it's an SF object of points. We also create an indices with points within the map. It's, an, it's a vector of yeah, of indices, which will be used um, later on. Then, yeah, the points within the map, so the DP object, it's still a rectangular object with 100 by 100 points. Now they are being filled because we are not interested in points outside of Bolivia. We are going to use the ST filter function to actually filter the points that are within the map of Bolivia. 
And we also need a matrix of their XY coordinates, which is done with the SD coordinates function and it's stored in the COOP object. So let's have a look at these prediction locations. So we can plot them in a similar fashion as with the event location. And you can see that indeed this original router has been cut off nicely with the border of Bolivia. So now we have these prediction coordinates. And in the same way as before, we can define a projection matrix that links the mesh with these coordinates, which is needed to then interpolate fitted values at the mesh nodes of intensities to interpolate them towards the prediction locations later on. So this will all be done with the inla function of inla, all these things. So we are nearly there. Now we have to combine all these specific components in a final stack object. So we are still going to compose some sub uh, objects first. So we define the observations and their objects and, and, and their offset, I mean, in two observation objects. So the observations themselves, it's either zero because there was no event or one because there was an event. And this is done, this means the number of mesh points times zero. And then once, with, and then this is repeated for n times, which is the number of events. So this is a, this is a vector of 2,242, I think, points. Uh, or our observations of zeros and ones, and then their offsets, it's for the mesh, it's the areas of the dual mesh. So for the mesh vertices, it's the areas of the dual mesh, and then it's zero for the um, events themselves. So this is the, the offsets for the observations. Then for the estimation, so this is for the fitting, uh, parts. So we create a stack, which we also provided that est for estimation. It gets the data for the of the observations and the offsets, and it also has the projection matrix, which is the a dot ops um, projection matrix, and it has effects per. Yeah, this is the low. So this is actually the indices for the. Yeah, this can be used for random effects. So the second one, for example, it's the position. So it is the number of each mesh vertex, which is being defined here. While in this case, it's an index of all observations, the B zero, but it's not an index. It's just always one because this is going to be fit with the local intercept. So. This is just uh, the B0 of the, which is going to be used in the formula. So this refers to um, parts which are going to be used in the formula. So this is their indices. And then for the prediction, we have something similar here, but then it's um, with the number of prediction locations that we repeat the one. And we still have the same for the mesh. But we are going to use the prediction projection matrix instead. And the data, it's now it's missing values because we request an outcome. So it's missing values uh, for the number of prediction locations. And their offset, it's also set as zero. So this gets the tag prediction, and we have another stack. So this is a stack for the prediction, and then we combine both stacks in a full stack. So we have one full stack, which is composed of the estimation stack and the prediction stack. So now we're there, so we can fit the model. So the formula, it's uh, there's no common intercept, but there's a location-specific intercept, and it has a Gaussian random field, which is this last part, part as discussed before. Then so the inla call, it, it uses this formula. It sets the family, it's Poisson. 
it refers to the data um, using the stack.foo, but it uses the in.stack.data function, which extracts the data, the data elements of this of these stacks which are in the stack.foo object. The controller predictor argument was used in the in chapter 15 as well. It, I think compute is true means that fitted values are being requested and computed also for the prediction locations. And all right, so here we are also setting or defining the projection matrix. The E, it's a specific argument of Inla, which is defining the offsets. So here we are saying, okay, it's that E part of the data that contains the offsets. And this offset, well, in the documentation of the inner function, it is the known component in the mean for the Poisson likelihoods, defined as EY times EXE to the power of eta Y, which is the, um, yeah, the Poisson likelihood. So, but the EY, it's the offset, it's the areas in our case, but it could also be volumes, etc. in case of Poisson likelihoods. So we have the res object here and it contains the results and we can extract specific parts of, for example, in this case, prediction uh, fitted values using the in.stack.index index function because with the we can yeah we can request which are the data values which are part of the prediction which which re represent the prediction location. So the stack of full it has this full list of two thousand two hundred forty two positions of observations and then uh, you have many more I think prediction uh, locations as well and if you the tag is equal equal split we can then request, okay, give me the index of the data set, which is uh, coming out of this uh, stack.full and also which is used in this uh, REST object. Give me the indices which refer to the prediction locations. And then this index is being used to subset the fitted values which are inside the REST object. So if the REST object has summary.fitted values, which means the it contains the mean and the some quantiles so lower and an upper confidence limit uh, which is given for the fitted values from the posterior distribution of these um, predictions so using the index you can subset them in order to request effectively the prediction locations so this index is created by using this function Sorry, Floris. Uh, yes. this, uh, uh, these values, they will be in the log scale as well, uh, the, the result, or? Uh, no, they are really in the response variable scale, so you're getting intensities, as I understand it. Okay, okay. As I yeah, understand as it. As it is a, a Poisson yeah. fitting it usually does it with with the log or not in yes. this case. Yeah, it, is, it uses the log link. Yeah. It does use the log link to... To, um, to fit the model, to, yeah. yeah. to fit the model, to just fit with using the linear predictor and the Gaussian random feed. So that's mm -hmm. done in the log scale, but then it's, mm -hmm. it's back transformed to the response okay. variable. So okay. I do believe this will be in the scale of the response variable because it's normally the case. Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. Cool. Okay, okay. All right. So well, that's a good question. So this spread mean, it's the, the mean values for all those prediction location. Then you have the lower limits and the upper limits. So it's just a vector, which you are getting here. Now we are going to store this inside the grid object. So this was the spot raster object. And we are first going to define these as layers inside this rust spot raster object. So by first defining these LL mean and UL layers and filling them with NA values. And then, and it's here that we need this indices points within vector, which defines the 
points of that 100 by 100 square grid, which defines the points, their, their index, which fall inside Bolivia, which match the prediction locations effectively. So we need to subset this, this grid, and then we can allocate these vectors coming out of INLA to the mean, to the lower limit and the upper limit layers. So when, then we are ready to have a look at the results of these predicted, predicted values. So we get a grid, a spot raster, which has three layers. It has the dimensions 100 by 100. It has this same coordinate reference system, and these are the values that are stored here, but it's minimum and maximum values, actually. And we can plot it using the tidy Terra function geom spot raster. So I think tidy Terra is not actually, I'm not sure if it was used in the book tidy Terra, but anyway, it's um, something which can be used. And so what we do here is ggplot using the geom spot raster to plot the grid. Then we can also modify the 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 graphic view of the plots because it's a map and use the quantum reference system that you have which we have set to plot the graphic view so the, the grid lines on the on the map we use the facet wrap to actually split the plots and show one plot for each layer in the grid and this sets the yeah, the color scale of this map and the minimal is just the theming of the map so this is then the results and that comes out. So what we can see is the intensity, the model intensity. So we can indeed see this pattern which we have seen in the point pattern already. So this should be values per square kilometer. So these these um, values you can see in the mean, the mean value, it's intermediate between lower limits and upper limits. So this is uh, the final result in the book. So with that, um, this is the last slide of the presentation, but are there further questions or remarks? It was not a very easy chapter for me, I must say, because sometimes the explanation is rather brief about some things. So from, from in la, like, can we get a simple uh, print of the model parameters like yes summary time yes yes model print. Okay. yeah i actually made it first it's a summary res uh, mm -hmm. but i then skipped it uh, because it's um output which is not being explained in the book either so it was not too helpful <laughs> okay. uh, because in the book it's not shown um mm -hmm. but in a sense essentially it it gave two parameters mm -hmm. uh, for the spde part okay but then I should have then looked further to in order to really comprehend it. Um, but I did have a look at the Krajinski et al. book from 2019. And there you can see that the explanations about how these inner workings of INLA uh, work and, and what they mean, what the outputs mean, it's, it's much more elaborate. So I think this is perhaps a disadvantage of this book. It's more general. I think chapters are quite... Uh, full of things, and uh, there was men uh, done a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. The explanations are rather brief, but in this, mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm glad that it is that we read this book because you get a feel of many different things. Okay. okay. So you you have an overview of many many different techniques, and at least understand um, yeah how they work or why why they work or what mm -hmm. they are intending to do. So I should not uh, overestimate that because um, in in many places in the book it is it's it's explained well enough. So it, it's sometimes here or there that that sometimes it's not uh, very clear if you're not familiar with some techniques. But uh, okay, but I think that's okay because the book really um, stresses the understanding of the the whole process uh, mm -hmm. rather than the the finest mathematical details. Mm 
Okay. Uh, sorry, Floris, can you put please in the chat uh, this reference, this book, 2019? Oh, you know, yes. About? Let's have a I look. Because um, I think, well, let me show. Perhaps it's also very interesting. The rinna.org. Ah, okay. okay. Websites. Oh, this website, yeah. And then you have Learn More. It's actually how I found the book. Um, <laughs> so then we have books. So let's, let's make this a bit larger. Books. So here we have. Oh, okay. Um, so this is the book in question. So Krajinski et al. And also this book from Gomez Rubio. It's also yeah. very didactical. I think okay. it's. Um, Really, they're all really good books, but there are more. There are certainly more. So this is another book of the same author, okay. of the book that we are reading. Yep. I think, okay, okay. Yes, maybe that's. I think this because this is specifically about our in law. That this will also be uh, much more elaborate. I think Federica has also referred to this book in the past already. Okay. All right. Cool. So there are some other ones as well. For example, in ecology, uh, personally, I've been using these already um, okay. yes and so this is the book we are reading yeah. it's it's <laughs> in the lists <laughs> okay okay thank you very much i appreciate it Floris. yeah you're welcome so you if if you want uh, the online so it's you click on the git book link cool. so and then you really access this book cool perfect all right perfect So thank you. Okay, thank you.